Hi, and welcome to this topi focused lecture. Actually, you will be hearing two lectures today. The first one being the deconstruction of a map of an unknown territory. This was originally the introduction to the Psychic Bible from 2009, and it has also been published in my book uh, Resonances from 2014. The other one is called Abstraction Made Concrete, the Occultural Methods and Mutations of the Temple of Psychic Youth. And this has been published in my book Occulture, the Unseen Forces that Drive Culture Forward from 2018. And there is some overlap in between these two talks, but for simplicity's sake, we can just call these amplifications or emphases. So, thank you for being here. Let's go. Probably no word does better justice to the topi phenomenon than occulture. Meshing occult with culture. And there's also a prefixed trace of occident, if you will. The defined concept as such was integrated in the intertopy lingo in the late 80s and then grew to become a readily accepted general term for anything cultural yet decidedly occult or spiritual. As a more or less unnamed concept, or culture had already been active in topi since day one basically. The field of research was never ever occultism per se, or culture per se, but always consisted of an interchangeability where eventually the clear-cut borders were gently erased. Books, pamphlets, newsletters, film and video screenings, record and cassette releases, and other manifestations could certainly contain more or less blatant uh, esoteric form or content, but it was in no way a prerequisite. The literal meaning of occult, as in hidden, was given a wider perspective than the merely magical one. Hidden information, forgotten personalities, discarded thought forms, uh, untrendy thinkers, eclectic evolutionaries, and anachronistic anarchs. Dusting off shelved illuminations from past ages and offering forgotten morsels of human intelligence proved to be a very fertile soil indeed. A Promethean strike force that passed on the torch of enlightenment from the dawn of mankind to our own revolutionary times. From very early on, there was a heavy focus on the unhampered sharing of information, hidden or otherwise. All one had to do was let one's interests and areas of research be known through newsletters and other uh, channels, and one was certain to receive something of interest. A second-hand book, long out of print, a compendium of Xeroxes from someone's equally enthusiastic uh, archive, a cassette tape copy of some recordings uh, never released on record or broadcast on radio. Seeing the global topi network as a precursor to the internet is not far-fetched at all. The first generation developers of so-called cyber culture were certainly aware of, and some of them even active in, topi and its ideas and ideals. Culture in itself is usually associated with performing arts, painting, music, literature, and many other forms of traditional manifestation, the sphere of culture. But essentially culture is exactly what the word entails. It's a culture, a structure or soil that contains the implicit possibility of growth and manifestation of life and, in extension, ideas and information. The merging of sperm and egg and their continued growth as one DNA programmed entity in a womb is perhaps the clearest and most potent symbol of culture. 
many of the Topi access points, which were regional headquarters. They were involved in releasing material for distribution. Could be books, magazines, records, videos, and so on. At Topi Scan, the Scandinavian section, we focused at times more on these kinds of activities than on the actual meeting of members and of doing strange rituals together. The more esoteric and magical uh, activity certainly took place too, but quite often these rituals were like cosmic boosters for the success of, for instance, a new magazine project or a new record. The intimate seed of individuals were sown in a communal soil for the benefit of occultural manifestations. These being, in turn, new transformed seed in a more extroverted universe of readers, listeners, art lovers, etc. On the more distinctly magical level, we organized several uh, workshops in shamanism, meaning here using uh, archaic techniques of, for instance, drumming to induce states of trance used for information gathering on entirely different and higher levels of consciousness. And also Western ceremonial magic. We made treks into the Swedish uh, countryside, stayed up all night and tried quite successfully to uh, communicate with hidden aspects of nature and our own minds. The rituals suggested in the Grey Book, which is the main topic compendium dealing with magic and philosophy, and other key documents, were often the starting point for members wanting to uh, experiment with uh, meditation, traditional methods of ceremonial magic, and one's own sexuality in a directed way. Rituals were by no means confined to the individual monthly sigilizing process, as recommended in the Grey Book, uh, but would develop and grow in organic forms, either individually or with other members. The status of Eden for the actively sigilizing men and Kali for the women signified an even stronger internal bond, that is, if one wanted to. There were never any demands on Kali's or Eden's to do or achieve anything except possibly to be truer to themselves than they had been up to that point. What the central Topi ritual consisted of, at least structurally, was that on the 23rd of each month, at 2300 hours, the dedicated adepts would perform a sigilizing ritual in and or on an artwork designed by themselves specifically for the desired goal. And this piece of highly charged talismanic art was then sent in to a topi station, which was a bigger and more administrative headquarters than the access points. The idea was to impose or inspire self-discipline and regularity to unite with other adepts in time to initiate personal empirical research about ritual magic and, not forgetting, to honor the weird synchronistic concept of the number 23, as inherited from Topi mentors William S. Burroughs and Brian Geisen. The augmented level of 23 consecutive sent in 23 sigils was reached by very few individuals connected to the Topi Europe headquarters. Usually, however, that level of commitment to an experimental yet communal goal manifested itself in other ways too, like active help with administration, practical assistance, uh, creating original things like texts, images, music for Topi publications, etc. And thus, few people were able to achieve quite a lot. The structure of official 
topi sigilizing combines elements of traditional sexual magic using the uh, elevated state of mind reached at and before the orgasmic climax to mentally charge a symbol of the desired, of the ideal, and also using the highly vitally charged residual secretions, semen and vaginal fluids. Meditational focus, uh, Eastern mantric techniques, Austin Osman Spare's development of an individual so-called alphabet of desire, elements of sacrificial use of blood and saliva, as well as other techniques to maximize the experience as such. Not forgetting creating a totally individual-based artwork to act as a receiving vessel or talisman for the desired thereby integrating art in its most important and primordial function as a magical and mystical tool to achieve union with higher cosmic levels of mind and to express one's affinity and desires with and to these levels. Very seldom is this art historic aspect of Topi considered. The archival collection of contemporary talismanic art ranging in styles from totally primitive abstractions to very refined draftsmanship over sexually explicit collages to mind-bending mixed media paintings and sculptures is totally unique in every sense of the word. The term magical art is usually ascribed to totemic objects from Africa or other non-Western areas. And it's usually something having to do with uh, the past. In the case of uh, the Topi collection, all the gathered works are indeed contemporary or present, but all bordering on, at least in the very moment of creation, the future. Another highly interesting aspect of this art is that it is in many ways an uh, anti-art. It's not art made specifically for other people to see, and thereby it doesn't fit in with the contemporary uh, ideals of pleasing an art market. And here we can return to the very origins of arts, like you know, cave paintings, etc. The idea was not to have a glass of wine together with tribal kin in a cozy cave to self-aggrandize through witty ironic criticisms. The idea was to impose one's will on the world outside your own personal sphere or that of the tribe. Art as magical evocation. And whether other members or other tribes actually could see or understand what one had inscribed or painted was besides the point. On an individual level, the experimenting was active and, I would say, radical. As an administrator of Topi Scan and later on Topi Europe, I was fortunate to see and handle uh, European Kali's and Eden's 23 sigils in trust, a trust that has been, is and will continue to be honored. I was also involved in a proto-creative dialogue with several members on magical results, effects, uh, breakthroughs, ups and downs of various techniques, etc. Hearing what had worked for others, uh, I empirically assembled and concocted my own grimoires in a way and shared my findings with those who had been sharing in their turn. An occultural topi concept in genuine, genuinely creative action. And there were also magical workings created and performed together. During the international gatherings, so-called uh, roto rites, Elaborate and ceremonial workings would be performed for goals that dealt with uh, greater Topi ideals and visions. At Topi Scan and Topi Europe, we would not infrequently experiment with sigilizing and other kinds of rituals uh, together. Sharing those kinds of intense and electrified physical and emotional moments with others in trust was a real eye-opener to many of those involved, including myself. 
The creative framework of a uniting crystal clear goal and of experimental techniques that evoke a previously unfelt emotional charge in the ritual chamber can be quite an empowering setting to be in. At the era of conception, uh, not an e inappropriate symbol in this case, the Topi network or net work as Peoridge would aptly call it, was tightly interwoven with the musical constellation called Psychic Television or PTV. From 1982 and onwards, PTV in their many guises were missionaries or individual of li individual liberty on a seemingly endless tour. Topi as a living entity was very integrated in PTV and became philosophical fuel, not only for the band members, but also for those already active or those just curious when the multicolored psychic circus rolled by basically all over the world. Some Topi members liked PTV and some did not. What was obvious though was that the Gesamt Kunstwerk aspect of what seemed to be, uh, what seemed to others to be just a weird band was an enormous source of inspiration for most of us. It was possible to do anything. Music was not confined to pop or noise or anything. Neither were the stage presentations, the performances, the artwork for the records, etc. Many of the young people involved in various phases of PTV grew up to be creative and successful uh, artists in their own right. And if there's something I think unites all of these people, it's an open-mindedness, a creative courage, and a spontaneity that in many regards have their origins in the uncompromising psychic television and Temple of Psychic Youth kaleidoscope. What constitutes the essence of all of this? Well, there are so many things that come to mind, but I guess the most quintessential ones are the offering of different possibilities, of alternative options, of alternative routes, of inspiring courage and will, of breaking apart uncomfortable imposed patterns and showing, by example, that it is after all possible to reassemble the bits in very creative ways. The concepts of occult, culture and even occulture become redundant on a higher level. What's here for us, uh, for us all in our apparently finite time frame is the definite possibility to access the infinite. How and why we as individuals go about this is another story, no less interesting. And the first phase of and phase of Topi as an experimental centrifugal intelligence agency was so fertile that it took on a life of its own and thereby touched upon the infinite. Regardless if one's path is that of a hermit or that of an ardent team player, a lot can be learned from this strange manifestation in human history and culture that has, more than any group structure before, taken on the conscious decision to give form and voice, and dare I say even direction, to the collective unconscious. Thank you for listening to this lecture. As mentioned, if you want to read it too, you will find it in my book Resonances, published by Scarlet Imprint in 2014. And now on to the next lecture, Abstraction Made Concrete, The Occultural Methods and Mutations of the Temple of Psychic Youth. I am here today to talk about an interesting phenomenon that existed for approximately 10 years, between 1981 and 1991 approximately. This phenomenon was like a mix between a magical order, a think tank, an archive, an experiment in intentional art and many other things. I'm talking about the Temple of Psychic Youth 
or Topi for short, which spread out of the UK and into the world and soon reached thousands of members and or subscribers to Topi's frequent newsletters and information. My own involvement in this began around 1984 when I started out as a humble subscriber to newsletters and bought records, pamphlets, fanzines, etc. from Topi's own mail order in the UK. I was very interested in all things occult at the time and I immediately realized that Topi was something brand new. Everything I had read about magic and occultism always dealt with something old, arcane, systematically symbolic and quite dusty. But not so with Topi. I was enthused and got involved and I started working with the UK people and set up a Scandinavian branch or access point aptly called Topi Scan. And this later developed into Topi Europe, which for me meant, meant basically a lot of administration run out of my little apartment in Stockholm. It was an incredibly creative time, I have to say. Uh, Topi Scan, Topi Europe, and an affiliated company that I started called Psychic Release put out books, cassettes, CDs, vinyl records, video cassettes, arranged workshops, lectures, film and video screenings, concerts, as well as more esoteric things like group rituals and magical workshops for those really active within this highly pragmatic sphere. Sometime in 1991 I burnt out and decided to not carry on as the administration had simply become so overwhelming um, and interestingly enough the key people in the UK and the US had felt exactly the same thing at about the same time. We basically decided it was time to end Topi as we knew it. A first phase of 10 hyper interesting years had gone by. So how do we begin when looking at this phenomenon? If we look to the UK, we can recognize some well-known people. Artist Genesis Peorage and his collaborators at the time, like Peter uh, Christofferson from um, the former project Throbbing Gristle, and also David Tibet and Alastair Crowley, Romantic, who also formed the band Current 93. These people decided to try and create a group synthesizing their own inspirations in art and magic and at the same time commenting upon uh, or influencing the harsh political climate of the UK. With magical mentors like Alistair Crowley, Austin Osman Spare, Tribal Shamanism and the literary and artistic cut-up applications of William Burroughs and Brian Geisen and artistic seed like the Surrealists, Dada, Mail Art, Situationism, 60s Counterculture and many many other things, a core developed that would grow to form the Temple of Psychic Youth. As a communal and quaquaversal entity rather than a hierarchic traditional order with followers. At center stage of this new hybrid was a video group that also made music called Psychic Television or PTV. This was formed by Peorage, Christofferson, uh, musician Alex Ferguson and David Tibet was in there too at an early stage as was Paula Peorage, uh, Genesis' wife. Taking advantage of the unlikely successes and infamy of the predecessor Throbbing Gristle, the group secured record deals with major labels like Warner and CBS, which at the time was almost beyond fluke level. But it happened. PTV started recording music and making videos that soon became a very integrated part of Topi and its magical philosophy. There was a great deal of writing going on too, the most well-known text being the Grey Book. What was it all about? What was the actual philosophy of Topi? 
Well, it's clear to see that there's a great deal of uh, Crowleyan thelema in it, meaning Crowley's philosophy of will and considerate subjectivism. But there was an amplification of this more general attitude of do what thou wilt in the technical sorcery system of British painter and magician Austin Osman Spare and the cut up methodology of writer William Burroughs and painter artist Brian Geisin, all latter day Topi saints, of course. The core was one of sacralized free will and an experimental technology was presented to root out bad habits imposed by others or simply one's own and generate change through quite often artistic means. PTV were very productive and also worked together with other filmmakers like Derek Jarman, uh, John Mabry, Sarah Wynne Evans to create a cinematic or televisual corpus of ritual footage, poetic propaganda and psychedelic playfulness. The musical side of things uh, took the entourage on the road to many many concerts all over the world. An example of this first phase could be uh, my own first experience of PTV Live which was in Stockholm in 1984. There was one video screening of their material at Konstfack, a college of art, on the first night and then a regular concert, concert which also included the videos at a rock club on the following night. There was a presence in both worlds, so to speak. Topi was not a hierarchical group or order, which was interesting as most esoteric history comes out of very hierarchical fraternities. It's more correct to say that Topi was a meritocracy structured atomically. The proton would be a station or an access point, that is the local points in time and space. And around these members and um, around these members and interested people constituted electrons and simply revolved. One key magical technique that mixed transformative potential with artistic expression was the process called sigilization. Formulated well by Austin Spare in his books, it basically meant stripping the conscious formulation of your desired goal into smaller particles or denominators that could then be creatively readjusted into new and highly un- or subconscious forms during some form of ecstatic mind frame, most often of a sexual kind. This should be done in an as aestheticized way as possible. For instance, on a sheet of paper and also include sexual liquids, blood and hair. And this would then constitute one's own very private and vividly symbolic manifestation of will. According to Topi's integration of William Burroughs' mind-boggling romanticism about the number 23, this sigilizing ritual should be performed on the 23rd of each month at 2300 hours. If you began that process, you were given a temple name, Eden, and a number for men, and Kali, and a number for women. If you completed 23 such sigils, you became elevated. Not necessarily in rank, but certainly in respect. But it was also totally possible to keep this process a uh, secret, if you so desired. These special sigils were sent in to the Topi stations in the UK, the US and eventually Europe. Where they were filed in confidence, and I don't think there has ever existed such a unique collection of he heterogeneous yet philosophically resonant magical art. Uh, this technique was the central one for active Topi members, but there were also other rituals that were performed um, together, quite often for communal goals and projects, but sometimes also for greater altruistic purposes. 
very often sexual in nature and method, but not necessarily so all the time. In the UK and US, workshops were held with a Native American Indian shaman called Nomad. And in Scandinavia, we did similar things with the Norwegian shaman Artur Sørensen, and also with the, with the percussive wizard artist Zev. This was focused on a more classical form of shamanism, with uh, mind travels to the different spheres or worlds, and communications with what or whomever was found there. Another overall method was filtering or stripping uh, thoughts and sentiments from the past, so they could fit our uh, contemporary times. Promoting forgotten geniuses like Spare, uh, beat iconoclasts like Burroughs or poet Harry Crosby, <clears throat> to mention but a few, catapulted these spirits into the psyches of a generation brought up on despair and desolation. And these pioneers had shown that it was possible, like Crowley had prophesied, to do what thou wilt. But certain psychic barriers had to be torn down or deconstructed first. Topi helped administer some of these tearing down techniques. There were other magical groups of like mind around at the same time, early 80s, 80s and 90s. The Illuminates of Thanateros, the IOT, generated a vortex of what they called chaos magic with a similar hardcore and pragmatic approach, often ingrained with scientific terms of the day like uh, quantum physics, etc. The Order of the Nine Angles, ONA, was a more sinister and dark group, or rather collective of individuals exploring satanic motives and motivations. It is interesting to see that uh, stagnant fraternal traditional orders dealing with some kind of esoteric teaching or practical magic, and a political climate that was based in a fiercely conservative approach to handling things um, like Margaret Thatcher's government in the UK, for instance, actually became fertile soil for truly thinking out of the box. Topi was never interested in politics per se, but actively promoted individual liberty on all levels and also fought for some pragmatic goals like uh, then current wildlife or animal rights issues. As this entire environment was deeply rooted in a post-punk or do-it-yourself DIY culture, the emphasis on a cottage industry psychology turned into great signal and very little noise. Almost every Topi station or access point had their own setup for producing printed matter, records, videos, etc all talismanic and all carrying a magical charge in their own peculiar way. Even if only for internal distribution, the output was big and local distribution warmly taken care of by devoted members. Hence the concept of a culture saw the light of day, as hundreds of Topi members digested and divested arcane lore in new and pop scientific ways to a DIY generation frustrated with lies, blunt propaganda and mass market ersatz commodities. From the glamorous spheres of occultism and counterculture, there now emerged a culture, containing sharp philosophies, magical technologies, kudos to those who had worked before us, whether in art or magic, and a general sense of enthusiasm in reveling in the great mystery of life and existence. Topi made out of print books available in photocopies to members, and forgotten musics were widely disseminated uh, via cassette tapes and ditto for forgotten yet inspiring films on VHS cassettes and pirate broadcasts. A lot of previously impossible to find things were suddenly made available. 
And this essential theme of availability became a bedrock, an essential foundation. Pragmatically appropriating and recontextualizing hidden morsels of subversive seed and flowers soon became a practical method in which previous levels of abstraction not seldom placed there because of the need for self-preservation became very concrete indeed. It was almost as if the process evolved smoother and faster exponentially, meaning the more the merrier. That's one level of concretization, demystifying old codes and spelling them out in an attitude of inquisitive analysis, like can we use this for something? This was true within Topi, uh, not only in breaking symbolic codes in traditional occultism and hermeticism, but also in pop cultural uh, appropriations. An example. Baros and Geisin were demigods in the Topi mythology. Lots of literature was available, but there was more to it. Genesis managed to borrow 16mm prints of the legendary Anthony Balch films with Baros and Geisin from the 1960s. I then traveled with these prints and showed them in Berlin, Copenhagen and other places at independent cinemas thereby not only reverently resonating with our icons, but also spreading them in a wider cultural context. I also traveled with a film program called Visions of O'Culture in 1989, which had Benjamin Christensen's beautiful film Hexan or Witchcraft Through the Ages, narrated by William Burroughs and some uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky films, and the same here, inter-order mythology and pop cultural expressions in a wider context. At the same time, uh, Psychic Release, my company, also republished some out-of-print books about runes in Swedish by older scholars. And this was relevant to our own um, availability in terms of the material itself. Rare book uh, and manuscripts appeared, new contacts were made, and many opportunities arose. This generated a field of dynamic creativity, in which many, many synchronicities appeared and greased the machine further. When the first Topi phase ended, something else immediately began. The internet began. And with this, a paradigm shift unparalleled in the history of human civilization. Immediately, there emerged a fiction-based subculture called cyberpunk, in which strains of Topi uh, inspirations, Burroughs, J.G. Ballard, and Philip K. Dick were established even more prominently than during the 80s, when it was mainly singular key people like Peorage and Joy Division singer Ian Curtis, who brought attention to important um, instigators like this. A new cyberpunk culture emerged that both feared and loved the internet. Magazines like the American Mondo 2000 questioned, codified, defined and redefined culture in internet times. One prime mover in the shadows was Genesis Peorich again, who had been exiled to California after the demise of Topi in 1991-1992. As a result of those early cyber movements came the successful Matrix films, after which followed a massive infusion of general hocus pocus in film and in literature. Lord of the Rings, uh, Harry Potter, Twilight, etc. Bland mass market expressions, yes, but still probably very indicative of a world in need of some serious re enchantment. Especially if we consider the enormous successes of all these films and franchises. Schematically, the internet is basically carrying on in a topi tradition, whether um, conscious of it or not. 
making things available, empowering an exchange of ideas and thoughts, promoting human development. Uh, and encouraging pioneering piracy rather than stale complacency. Perhaps in some ways infringing, but in the hope that some kind of good mutation will happen because of it. A term, <coughs> a term like occulture is today widely used both within academia and in pop writings, basically signifying the same thing as when Piorich coined the term the sphere of impact in general society of building blocks or memes previously kept hidden for various reasons and thereby becoming glamorous enough to draw attention to themselves. Occulture is also when a previously occulted behavioral pattern or technique for affecting change in accordance with will is integrated in general society and accepted as reasonable behavior. The past decades wave of pop yoga and pop meditation could be seen as examples of this. In 2009, a volume called The Psychic Bible was published by Feral House. The first edition, <coughs> first edition also came with a DVD with a selection of some of the early Topi films. The book proper contains basically all documents and writings that were official Topi teachings. What was surprising was not that most of it had matured quite nicely and wasn't as dated as I think uh, many old timers had suspected. The most surprising thing was the interest in the market, so to speak. The first edition sold out and a paperback version has uh, been out since then, uh, selling in thousands of copies. This should indicate that there is a respect for the topi phenomenon as such and that the ideas presented uh, back then are equally valid today, if not even more so. And I think it was American Apparel that earlier this year released a t-shirt with a psychic cross, uh, a logo trademarked by Peorage, that was quickly removed. But it's still interesting that in the psyches of these uh, industrial hipster designers, this symbol somehow exists and feeds back something uh, quite substantial, regardless of whether uh, they're conscious of it or not. Another interesting phenomenon today is, of course, uh, the massive uh, interest both within the art world and academia for uh, predominantly Western esotericism. I'm not saying Topi alone can take a bow for this, but ending 23 years ago, there had certainly been a full decade's worth of bringing out exactly that. Artists dealing with topics spiritual, iconoclastic, or both. And the recent exhibition of uh, Hilma of Klint's paintings has so far been seen by over a million people. And the Venice Biennale of 2013 was immersed in art and spirituality, displaying not only Jung's Red Book, but also Frida Harris's uh, Crowley-designed Toth Tarot paintings, etc. In younger generations of artists, esoteric themes overflow, and when they backtrack in the more recent history of magic and esoteric art, they will surely find topi material or formulated thoughts somewhere along the line. Or culture abounds. And there is presently also a strong resurgence or romanticism when it comes to cottage industries. The emergence of a new cassette culture, vital vinyl editions, and fanzine publishing, including anachronistic use of risographs and vintage Xerox machines. Again, we cannot say that Topi deserves all the praise for this movement, because uh, that would simply be too grandiose a statement. Uh, but the occurrence in itself certainly points nostalgically to a time when there was a massive and substantial 
pre-internet expression of intimate philosophies, forgotten gems, as well as magical and or marginal art, rather than some kind of soulless mass production. Thank you for listening to these Topi lectures. I hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed them both. If you want to support my work, please buy my books and please also consider joining the Patreon that I have together with my wife, artist and psychoanalyst Vanessa Sinclair at www.patreon.com slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Related links are also listed in the information about this video lecture. Again, many thanks and I hope to see you soon again.